caffeine right before bed and or three hours before bed and or even six hours before bed and found that even six hours out that caffeine consumption led to measurable disruptions in their sleep quality. Today, we're covering the four hidden things that could be destroying your sleep quality. Again, these are things that are very pervasive in our culture. And unbeknownst to you right now, it might be something that is causing issues with your sleep cycle. It might be causing issues with you falling asleep and staying asleep and just going through that natural rhythm that we really require in order to get sufficient healthy sleep. So let's start with this statement first and this discussion, which is what is sleep really? Well, when we're looking at this conversation about sleep, it's a very strange thing, isn't it? Sleep is weird, but it's something that is required because we would have evolved out of it long ago if it wasn't something that was of the utmost importance for human evolution and survival. Because it's during sleep, because of our incredible brains, they're doing so many different processes for us. And many of these processes, we need to shut things down because so much energy is required to do housekeeping with our brains. Here's a little fun fact that you might not know. Your brain actually shrinks while you're asleep. I know it sounds weird and might be like, I don't want that. I'm going to stay awake forever. This is actually a good thing because your brain swells throughout the day because of all of the uh, metabolic waste products that get accumulated, right? Your brain is doing millions of processes a minute and there's new cells uh, being created. Old cells are dying. You know, there's a lot of waste products and we have to get that stuff out. Your brain has to, quote, detoxify itself. And there's the blood-brain barrier. So there's not a direct connection with your lymphatic system, which kind of handles the cellular waste management of the rest of your body. Your brain has its own system. It's called the glymphatic system. This glymphatic system is a little shout out. It's run by the glial cells in your brain to help to eliminate these wastes. And your brain can shrink about 20% during sleep as it's getting rid of these wastes. And this glymphatic system is 10 times more active during sleep than when you're awake. This is when that housekeeping takes place. And we know today that issues with uh, conditions like Alzheimer's, which is now the sixth leading cause of death, all right, sixth leading cause of death today, that Alzheimer's is now found to be related to an inability of the brain to detoxify itself. Now, this is correlated with what else is happening in our society, massive issues with sleep deprivation. And this is my argument is that this is one of the things we need to address so we can start to see a reduction in these rates of conditions like Alzheimer's. And that's just one component of it. But when we're talking about sleep, so what is it? Sleep is this really interesting phenomenon where we see repair and improve function of our brains, of our muscle, you know, things like muscle repairs taking place. Our hormones are getting optimized and back on track because there's different hormones as we go throughout the day, different hormones are being produced. And during sleep is a crucial time because it's a very anabolic state where you're producing a lot of anabolic hormones. But we, how do we know we're asleep? We know that we're asleep. We can monitor this when we see changes in our brain waves. To really make it super simple, Sleep is a change in our brain rhythms, all right? So as we're awake right now, we're in a state of beta, right? We've got these beta waves taking place for the most part. We can get into some gamma too, all right? We can get into some gamma. But from there, we transition as we move into sleep. We move into the alpha. It's a very uh, relaxed state of focus if we're awake and can get into the alpha state, right? So that's something that we transition into. Then from the alpha, we move to theta, this is that transitionary st state into sleep. And then we move into delta, right? That's that deep anabolic sleep. And we're cycling throughout these, throughout the night. And we need to spend an adequate time in each stage of sleep. And depending on which expert you talk to, we've got four stages of sleep. Cycling predominantly what we talk about is REM sleep and non-REM sleep. And REM sleep is the rapid eye movement sleep, right? This is when you are getting your dream on. This is also where a big part of memory processing takes place and converting what you're learning even right now to your short-term memory, all right? It's becoming more consolidated and filed away during sleep. And so on average, our sleep cycles are somewhere around 75 to 120 minutes in some cases, going through all of those four stages efficiently. And during your first part of your sleep in the evening, 
you're going to spend more time in Delta. And as the, the night goes on, you spend less and less time in Delta during each sleep cycle. And so all of these stages are important, but they can be interrupted. They can be interfered with. They can be damaged by certain things that we are exposed to today. And so today, again, we're going to cover the four hidden things that could be destroying your sleep quality. And we're going to start number one with something called MSG, all right, MSG, or monosodium glutamate. It's labeled as a flavor enhancer that's been used in food production for decades now. And monosodium glutamate is simply the sodium salt or the ionic form of glutamic acid. And now this is an amino acid that is one of the building blocks of many proteins. So it's something that we need, we, we require, but this is the ionic form of it. And some of it occurs naturally in the cooking process or even fermentation process. And that's all good, but commercially processed MSG is a potential culprit in several health issues. So let's just start with this before we get into the sleep connection. And by the way, so what is the flavor enhancement? What is it? It really plays on that umami fla uh, flavor sensation. So we've got sweet and salty and bitter and sour. But the other one that is kind of newly discovered and talked a little bit more about is umami. Right? First of all, I just like saying umami. But that's more of the savory kind of thing that's attributed to the flavor and, and um, uh, experience of things like broth and different meats and things like that. So that's that umami flavor. So MSG really enhances that. Now listen to this. Research published in the journal Obesity confirmed that animal studies indicate monosodium glutamate can induce hypothalamic lesions, lesions in the brain and leptin resistance, possibly influencing energy balance and leading to obesity. Wow. When we hear like, oh, it's controversy around this, we don't know what MSG really does. It's right here. It's in the journal Obesity. And so leptin resistance, potentially, this could be a huge culprit in obesity because leptin is your body's major satiety hormone, helping to really regulate your appetite. And so when, leptin, when you have leptin resistance, this is going to inherently lead to being hungrier more often. All right, so that's what they're seeing in animal studies. But what about the people? What about the people? A human study published in 2008 in the journal Obesity looked at the MSG intake of 752 people between the ages of 40 and 59 and found that MSG consumption was directly correlated with higher rates of being overweight. The study also accounted for other factors like physical activity, total energy intake, and MSG was clearly a culprit connected to having a higher body mass index. All right, there you have it. It's not just, I don't know if it's a potential issue. It probably is, it probably is. Now, where is it? Where is MSG sneaking its way into your body? Well, it's used pervasively as a flavor enhancer in things like fast food and restaurants and frozen meals and canned soups, potato chips and things like that. Now, what this is kind of labeled as out there, which is, this is the controversial part about it, is this category of what are known as excitotoxins. And according to Dr. Jo Joseph Mercola, and he was on the show a while back. We put that episode in the show notes. Quote, MSG is one of the worst food additives on the market and is used in canned soups, crackers, meats, salad dressings, frozen dinners, and much more. It's found in your local supermarkets and restaurants, in your child's school cafeteria, and amazingly, even in baby food and infant formula. And he goes on to say that one of the best overviews of the very real dangers of MSG comes from Dr. Russell Blaylock, a board-certified neurosurgeon and author of Excitotoxins, The Taste That Kills. In it, he explained that MSG is an excitotoxin, which means it overexcites your cells to the point of damage or death causing brain damage to varying degrees and potentially even triggering or worsening learning disabilities, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, Lou Gehrig's disease, and more. And part of the problem is that free glutamic acid is the same neurotransmitter that your brain, nervous system, eyes, pancreas, and other organs use to initiate certain processes in your body. 
Even the FDA states this, quote, studies have shown that the body uses glutamate and amino acid as a nerve impulse transmitter in the brain and that there are glutamate responsive tissues in other parts of the body as well. Abnormal function of glutamate receptors has been linked with certain neurological diseases, such as Alzheimer's disease and Huntington's chorea. Injections of glutamate in laboratory animals have resulted in damage to nerve cells in the brain. Now we know that this has a significant impact on our brains and other cells in our bodies. But what about the sleep connection? Listen to this, this is nuts. A 2013 study published in the journal Nutrition found that MSG intake was significantly associated with snoring and a high probability of sleep disordered breathing in test subjects who were of a normal body weight. What? That is nuts. MSG is related to sleep disordered breathing. Snoring, this is another big epidemic right now because trust and believe if you have sleep disordered breathing, you're going to be having interrupted sleep cycles because that lack of oxygen is going to cause you to come out of different stages of sleep. You might not be conscious of it. You might not fully awake, but it's going to interrupt because it's a survival response if you're not getting enough oxygen in. Now, I specifically wanted to share this information about MSG because this is something that has been anecdotally a problem for me, causing issues with my sleep. And I didn't know this at first, but this is the benefit of really doing this work and getting more in touch with your body is that you start to see different patterns and when something is different that you maybe eaten or that you did different with your activity and it might have an impact on your sleep, for example. And I was able to analyze consistently because a lot of the recipes we were using at the time was incorporating some, you know, soy sauce and things like that that typically have some, sometimes it's naturally occurring and uh, sometimes it's added MSG in it. And every time I would have this very strange, like, not, I couldn't quite fall asleep. I was just like just below the surface of consciousness, if I could explain it like that. And it was just like, it was terrible. It was just terrible sleep whenever I would have it close to bedtime. And sure enough, recently, because it's been a couple of years since I've like gone out and we went to BF Chang, I never been. What's the, I wanted to know what's the big deal. You know, they got the statues outside, the big, the big horse sculptures. I'm like, it must be something. So we had uh, the P.F. Chang's for dinner. I had some dishes that had some soy sauce in it. And sure enough, I had that crummy sleep that night, especially like the first phase in trying to fall asleep. My sleep latency was disturbed, which is literally the opposite for me 99.9% .9 of the time. And I knew, okay, wow, that's, it really does affect me. Now, everybody's gonna be different. You know, it might not have that kind of an impact on you, but this is something that I wanna make sure you have this information in your possession because it might be helpful for you now, maybe later, and also for the people that you care about potentially. And uh, what I wanna share is this, the final straw for me in putting this on the list that broke the sleep deprived camel's back was a 10 week study cited in the journal Pediatrics reported that more than 50% of hyperactive children showed fewer behavior problems and less trouble sleeping when they implemented a diet that was free of artificial and chemical food additives, including monosodium glutamate. And the next culprit we're gonna talk about on a list, specifically those two things were the main things that they pulled out, which we're gonna to get to that in a moment. But I wanna make sure that you know some of the hidden names of MSG, because sometimes it won't say monosodium glutamate on the label. This could be in the name of hydrolyzed vegetable protein or textured vegetable protein, yeast extract seasonings. What is seasonings? Just tell me what the season is, you know? And again, sometimes companies are doing the right thing and they're literally just, you know, it's a, maybe a secret ingredient of seasonings, right? Maybe it's just, you know, a little sea salt, a little uh, sugar, you know, some paprika, I don't know. But sometimes it's just a blanket way that you can slide some MSG in there as well. So uh, just keep that in mind. What we want to do is if you do potentially have some uh, issues with MSG and you know things like soy sauce, just make sure that you have it a little bit early in the day. It doesn't bother my sleep if I have it you know, for lunch, for example. 
because my body can have time to metabolize it. But this might be something you need to pull out completely. And even hearing that study with the kids, that is really something to think about and to really support and protect our, our babies. All right, so that's number one on our list of these four hidden things that could be destroying your sleep quality. Let's move on to number two. There was a study conducted by researchers at Wayne State University School of Medicine. And what they discovered was that having a cup of coffee or even caffeinated tea too close to bedtime can be terrible for your sleep quality. What they did was they gave test subjects caffeine right before bed and or three hours before bed and or even six hours before bed and found that even six hours out that caffeine consumption led to measurable disruptions in their sleep quality. All right, so caffeine can be a big problem. That's number two on our list with disrupting your sleep quality. Now, there's a clear distinction that I got to make right here because there's a difference with the objective and subjective experience with this caffeine consumption and sleep. So in the study, the test participants subjectively thought that they got the same amount of sleep. You know, we'll just say it's eight hours. But objectively, using sleep monitor, they found that the test subjects, when they had caffeine even six hours before they went to bed, they lost about an hour of their sleep. An hour of their sleep quality was lost. All right, so they might think subjectively, oh, I slept for eight hours, lost a full hour because of caffeine being active in their system. Now, what is going on? First of all, full disclosure, I'm a fan. I'm a fan of caffeine. I think it's, I think it's gift. I think it's great, but it all needs to be in its proper perspective because we can definitely abuse it and we can use it in ways that, that definitely can hurt us. And one of the things about it is that caffeine has a half-life of, on average, about five to eight hours. So that means, we'll just say you consume 200 milligrams of caffeine. And that's a normal, we'll just say a cup of coffee, right? So half-life is after, if, we'll just say the half-life is eight hours. So if you consume 200 milligrams, eight hours later, half of it is still active in your system. So 100 milligrams. And we got to keep in mind that caffeine is a very powerful nervous system stimulant, right? And then after that, eight hours later, half of it is still active in your system. So half of the hundreds so of 50 milligrams, that could be enough to stir up the pot. It could be enough to stir up the, the kittens in your mind. What? Why did I say that? <laughs> it could be enough to really cause disruptions with your, with your sleep quality. So keeping that in mind, number one, caffeine is a very powerful nervous system stimulant. Also, caffeine, what it does directly is it elevates your cortisol and adrenaline. Those are part of the reason why you get the stimulation from it. All right. So it, it, it causes the secretion of stress hormones. All right. So that's the second thing. But I also want to share this with you because caffeine doesn't, quote, give you energy in the exact way that we tend to think it does. So we have the aspect of being a stimulant, yes. But a more interesting aspect in how it makes you feel like you're energized or not tired is that it has this really interesting connection with something called adenosine. Now, every day while you're awake, neurons in your brain are firing and producing a neurotransmitter byproduct called adenosine. Now, adenosine is not some, for years it was just considered like a, just a waste product, a throwaway product, but it's not that because as adenosine is being produced, it fits into receptor sites that start to nudge you to go to sleep. So this adenosine production, as it's being made in your body, it is fitting into receptor sites that start to make you tired, sleepy, relax. All right, now here's the interesting thing about caffeine. Caffeine has the ability, because it's so similar in its structure, to fit into receptor sites for adenosine. And so it can just sit in there, in those receptor sites, like a family member overstaying their welcome on your couch. And it just sits there. And your body is continuing to produce adenosine, which is going to nudge you to go to sleep, but it can't get into the receptor site. And so you actually don't even know how tired you are. So I hope that makes sense. Because the caffeine is sitting in the receptor sites, 
Adenosine can't do its job to start to nudge you to go to sleep, to relax, to, uh, to take a nappy. Now, listen to this. What does this do over time is the question. And it starts to really throw off the normal rhythm or the, the, the actual normal functioning of your endocrine system and your nervous system, which is this beautiful symphony that's always working to keep you well. And so what happens when you have all this buildup and you don't actually shut things down and sleep and relax like your body is wanting you to do, this can lead to uh, elevated levels of stress hormones specifically, which can lead to a whole host of problems from issues with um, you know, anxiety to uh, accumulation of, of excess fat and to obviously sleep deprivation. So just keeping that all in context, this is one of the things that caffeine does. So if you're going a little bit too hard with the caffeine, this can definitely cause some problems with your entire circadian rhythm. All right, so these are all aspects of the interaction that caffeine can have with our, in relationship to our sleep and our health. But again, I'm a fan and I believe that we can take advantage of it and use it in an intelligent fashion. And it could be great. It could be great. But here's a couple of things that I want you to, to keep in mind to, to do so that's not causing issues with your sleep. I'm a big fan of consuming caffeine in the early part of the day because just even in the cycle of cortisol secretion, you're supposed to get a cortisol kick in the morning. That's a natural cortisol rhythm. And I think it can support getting that, that rhythm on track for a lot of people who are clinically, we call them tired and wired, where the cortisol is too low in the morning, causing them a difficult time to get out of bed, and it's too high in the evening, right? And they're just up. So this can help to reset that if we're having some caffeine in the morning for some people. And so what I would recommend is to have a caffeine curfew, just a time that we shut it down and we don't have caffeine the rest of the day. And that can be really helpful. And it depends on your metabolism for caffeine because, again, it could be somewhere on average five to eight hour half-life. Some people metabolize it even faster than that and some slower. Some might need to cut it out totally, whereas others can have it a little bit later in the day. But I would not go, if you just say you're trying to get to bed by 11, I would still give myself a solid eight hours preferably more, but a solid eight to be done consuming the caffeine, all right? I prefer even before noon. But in our culture, we don't really think about this a lot, you know? I was at a, uh, you know, when we go to a nice restaurant and then after you're done with your meal, you know, we're out for dinner, it's eight o'clock, you're kicking it, you're gazing into each other's eyes. And then the guy comes over, he's like, hey, would you guys like a cappuccino, coffee, what? No, actually. And I was just, it took a while for me to really listen to it because I would just be like, no, I just never really thought about it. And it, it hit me that people do that because they're asking for a reason. Obviously, people are doing that. They're hitting that, they're hitting that cap. They're hitting that chino at night, right before bed. And then wondering why they're gonna have issues sleeping. And again, this might not be conscious. And they just the, the next day, maybe they had some wine or whatever, and they, they're having this hangover. You know, and these two things are competing and causing these different uh, endocrine and nervous system issues and, and stimulation and deprivation. It's just, you know, so just keep this stuff in mind. And maybe hopefully this can help you to think a little bit differently when you're out to dinner and whether or not you're going to have that cup of coffee, you know, at nine o'clock at night. It's probably not the best idea. Now, another small thing I want to direct your attention to is it's not just coffee that can be the issue. It's not just uh, tea, you know, caffeinated teas, but there are some other things that you might be chocolate, you know, having a, a nice amount of chocolate in the evening might cause some issues, but chocolate also has some other compounds that are more relaxing too. But for some people, it might be an issue, you know, even having a, a hot chocolate in the evening. So just keep that in mind. What are the substances that we consume on a regular basis that have a nice amount of caffeine in it? Another one is kombucha. Kombucha, let me tell you, I, it's one of those things. I would have kombucha in the later part of the, the evening and it would cause that same weird kind of not really falling asleep sleep for me. And I didn't realize that it can have a potentially pretty uh, high amount of caffeine in it because it is fermented and using the, of course, you know, the, the kombucha, the, the mother is what it's called. But also uh, it's generally going to be a caffeinated tea that is used as kind of the base for making the kombucha. And so it will cause issues with me sleeping. And also 
it can have a nice amount of alcohol in kombucha. I don't know if you knew that. In some states, like they actually, it's a warning on the bottle. Like it's like you got to be 21 to buy the kombucha, right? And I experienced this, you know, I remember I was driving home. I was in the passenger side with my wife and we were young in our marriage still. And I'm sipping on a kombucha and she's driving, which is rare, by the way. I'm usually, uh, you know, the one putting in the miles. But I was kicking back. I was sipping on some kombucha and everything just got really funny to me. You know, I was just like laughing about silly stuff and just laughing. And I couldn't really stop laughing. It's just what's going on. She's like, you sound like you're tipsy. And I was like, but I'm just drinking kombucha. Stop, stop it. And I'm just laughing about that. And come to find out, yeah, it does have a nice little bit of alcohol in there too, which again, could cause issues with sleep. Is alcohol proven to help us to fall asleep faster? Absolutely, it absolutely does. But one of the things that it can do is something called a REM rebound effect. And our REM sleep specifically gets damaged when we have alcohol too late to bedtime. So alcohol could have made this list as well. I might throw in a couple of bonuses. That is a bonus actually. All right, so having an uh, alcohol curfew, giving your body some time, and also nature's solution to pollution is dilution. All right, so helping your body to process. What happens when you drink alcohol? You tend to pee a lot more because your body's just trying to flush it out. You know, so support your liver and your bladder and your kidneys and uh, just having a little bit more, more water can really help to eliminate uh, sleep issues and hangover symptoms. The hangover experience is just a result of having damaged REM sleep. That's why we really experience that uh, with alcohol. So just keep that in mind as well. Now, I also wanna share with you a little hack when it comes to the caffeine side of things, because sometimes you're just gonna be in a situation where, you know what, you know, maybe you're, you're, you're working late or maybe you are in that kick it, you know, like it's nine o'clock with friends and you're gonna be out for a while and you're gonna, and you're gonna order that Chino, all right? You're gonna, you're gonna hit the Chino. And so what do you do? Here's a little hack for you, and this is using L-theanine, all right? L-theanine acts as an effective counterbalance to caffeine. Now, this is an amino acid that also is considered to be in the camp of nootropics, which are substances that may improve cognitive function. In fact, a placebo-controlled study published in the journal Nutritional Neuroscience found that versus consuming caffeine alone, taking L-theanine and caffeine in combination are significantly beneficial for improving performance on cognitively demanding tasks. All right, so just taking caffeine alone versus having caffeine with L-theanine, uh, the test subjects performed far better. Now, it's also known to amplify these alpha brain waves. So we talked about alpha being the transitionary stage as a lot of folks as we transition into sleep. But this can be a waking state as well that allows for a, a kind of calm centered focus now it's also a natural anxiolytic meaning it reduces anxiety in humans and can even reduce blood pressure and normalize heart rate and it does this by reducing levels of stress hormones like cortisol while substances like caffeine elevate cortisol all right so you see how this is a really interesting counterbalance now l-theanine has also been shown to boost levels of GABA in your system as well, and other hormones and compounds that promote calm, focus, regulated mood, and good sleep. So GABA is related in that track as well. GABA is an important neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. In fact, it is the major inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain, which means that it blocks the action of excitatory brain chemicals, All right? So L-theanine's connection to GABA is another way that it can support kind of counterbalancing caffeine and helping you to sleep. So if you've had caffeine a little late or a little bit too much, try some L-theanine. All right, so that's a little hack for you. But just keep in mind, like with any supplement, it should be respected and not overused because this is a supplement. It's not real food. We want to focus on food first and then supplements to be supplemental to the good stuff that we're doing. All right, so there's another little strategy for us addressing the caffeine issue in our sleep, but also simply taking some time off and cycling caffeine is a really great tool. And I personally do that, you know, so maybe if you're having caffeine five days a week, maybe you take two days off, or maybe you're doing it uh, pretty consistently for a month and then maybe you take a week off or 
cycle things. We should really cycle just about everything that we do, uh, unless it's a tonic, which is something that is, you know, historically that is con- it's used daily, and it just has a more and more beneficial effect as it kind of uh, accumulates or has an exponential benefit for you. But most stuff needs to be cycled, and so I would cycle my caffeine. All right, so that's number two on our list of these four hidden things that could be destroying your sleep quality. And so now we're going to move on to numero trace. Number three here on our list is going to probably trip you out a little bit and something that can be potentially damaging your sleep that is just incredibly widespread today. And this is based on a study, and this is published in the journal Neuropsychobiology, looked at the effect of electromagnetic fields like that of Wi-Fi and cell phones and the impact that it has on healthy human test subjects. The study results found a REM suppressive effect with reduction in duration and percentage of REM sleep when exposed to Wi-Fi cell phone radiation. Moreover, researchers discovered qualitative abnormalities of the EEG signal. This is used to measure the brain's electrical activity during REM sleep. So these exposures that we're all just pervasively exposed to today has an impact. It can literally damage your REM sleep. The researchers said, quote, knowing the relevance of REM sleep for adequate information processing in the brain, especially concerning memory function, in learning processes, the results emphasize the necessity to carry out further investigations on the interaction of this type of electromagnetic field and the human organism, end quote. What we got to understand is that this is a new technology, all right? This is something that we have not been exposed through to throughout our evolution as humans. This is very, very new, and we don't really know the long-term ramifications. We're playing with these energies and we don't know how they interact and could be affecting our bodies. Now, let's just get real basic for a moment here. Just using our just common, basic, simple knowledge base. We understand Wi-Fi, for example. Wi-Fi can go through walls, floors, ceilings. It's, it can go through all this stuff. You think it can't go through you? You think it's not going into your body and through your body and interacting with your cells, it absolutely is. It's just, it's Captain Obvious because more so than the walls and the floors, you are a much more permeable and even conductive entity than your floors, all right? And you are an electromagnetic being yourself. And so of course these things travel through us and um, interact with our cells. And this is one of the things that we're seeing is that it can cause issues with cellular communication, thus issues with hormones and neurotransmitters and just how your body is functioning. We don't know, again, the long-term ramifications, but I just want to put a spotlight on this for, for us to think about it. And we could do some things to potentially limit some of the exposure because we don't really know yet, but we don't need to walk around with the tinfoil hats because, you know, wi- I, I like Wi-Fi, okay? When I get on the plane, give me the Wi-Fi. All right. Let me get that Wi-Fi password whenever I go to your house. I need that. All right. But if we could put this in a little bit of perspective. And so what I want to share with you, and this is direct from chapter 12 in my book, Sleep Smarter. And this says researchers at Lowborough University Sleep Research Center in England set out to test the impact of cell phone radiation on the human brain. In the study, they strapped cell phones to the heads of study participants and monitored their brain waves by EEG while the phone was switched on and off by remote computer. The experiment revealed that after the cell phone was switched to the talk mode, as if you were on a call, brain wave patterns called delta waves remained depressed for more than an hour after the phone was turned off. These delta brain waves are the most reliable marker of deep sleep. A significant portion of your sleep consists of this stage, and interference with it will have a noticeable effect on sleep efficiency, which is exactly what the researchers observed. When the test subjects were allowed to go to sleep, 
they ended up remaining awake twice as long after the phone was shut off. They could not fall into deeper levels of sleep for nearly one full hour after the cell phone radiation stopped playing hide and go seek with their brainwaves. Now, again, that's directly from Sleep Smarter, chapter 12. Maybe you want to check that chapter out again, or if you haven't read Sleep Smarter yet, what? Make sure you grab yourself a copy. You could even grab the audio book. And uh, this is just crazy, you know, just being able to see it directly impacts your brain waves. That's nuts. That's nuts. And so, yeah, there's recommendations out there about not holding your phone up to your head. But what do we do? It's a phone. It's a phone. What do you expect? But we don't have to sleep with our phone right on our pillow with us. Because right now we've got millions of adults who are sleeping with their phones. And it's just a very, again, this is new. And this is an abnormal behavior that could have some abnormal side effects. So what are some of the things that we can do for supporting our own health and our, and our sleep as far as Wi-Fi exposure and cell phone uh, radiation? Number one, something very simple is to put your phone in another room when you go to bed potentially. And some people might, I just can't do it. That's like putting my arm in another room. What? I can't. Listen, there's a 99.99% chance it, everything's going to be okay. The world is not going to end because your phone is not right there next to you on your pillow. All right. You're going to be all right. If the world ends, I'll call you. Okay. Put your phone will be in the other room. So don't worry about it. But anyways, you're probably going to be okay. All right. So at least giving some space. All right. So if you do have it in your room, because a lot of folks will be like, Sean, well, it's my, it's my alarm clock. How am I going to get up in the morning? Get an alarm clock. Get an actual alarm clock if your phone is your issue. Because some folks, you know, just that's the last thing we do before we go to sleep. We stare at our phones, which we know the impact that it has on increasing cortisol and suppressing melatonin. We've talked about that many times on the show. Or if we happen to wake up, we don't do like our ancestors did, which they would have these... Um, dual phases of sleep, basically those dual sessions. Sometimes, you know, you can sleep through the night or, you know, some folks historically would wake up, you know, they go to bed when the sun goes down, first of all, so you have time to do this. And maybe they sleep for four hours, then they get up and, you know, maybe they write by candlelight or they eat or they have sex or they um, do some do some reading or talking, but then they go back to sleep for another, you know, three, four hours, you know, till the sun comes up. And so that's normal. But today, if we happen to wake up and your cell phone's right there, you're screwed. You get on your cell phone, guess what's going to happen? Stimulation of your brain, elevation of stress hormones. It's just the name of the game. So let's get a better relationship with our, with our device. So that's number one. Or and if it is closer to you, put it on airplane mode at least, right? Put on airplane mode just as a little safeguard, it's a tiny thing, but these tiny things might accumulate and we might know years from now that, oh wow, these cell phones being next to us while we're sleeping was an issue. And so I don't want you to be that much of an experiment right now. So that's that. And also uh, something that I do that I learned from Katie Bowman, I put my Wi-Fi on a uh, electrical timer. So it's just a little simple thing I got from Amazon. It's just, you know, I think it was like 10 bucks maybe. And it sets your outlet on a timer. So we got the Wi-Fi plugged into that and it just will basically shut off uh, at a certain time. You know, I could set it for 11 o'clock at night or, and then set it to come back on at 5 a.m. or whatever the case might be. But just giving my space, you know, in my home some time to not have that pervasive Wi-Fi umbrella just bathing, that we're bathing in it. Now, this might be a little bit, this is even on the edge for me of being like, a little bit concerned because we don't have enough data, but I have enough data to make me cautious and to make me ask questions. And so that's all I want you to do. You know, we don't got to break out the tinfoil hats, like I said, but we do want to start to pay attention to this because we're only going to learn more and more and more as the years go on, as far as our exposure to Wi-Fi and our cell phone radiation. All right. So that's number three on our list. All right. Of these four hidden things that can be deeply damaging your sleep quality. So let's move on. Now we could move right to number four, but I wanna add in a bonus one because I think this is, is very important for us to talk about this. And this is something that I took a chance on even putting this information into Sleep Smarter. 
And I'll tell you why in just a moment. But a renowned scientist and chemist, James Sprott, a PhD, he believed that sudden infant death syndrome or SIDS uh, can result from a variety of causes. But he felt that the number one concern was toxic gases and off-gassing of these mattresses generated from uh, what the babies were sleeping on. And he asserted that these compounds uh, containing phosphorus, arsenic, and other things that were added to mattresses and still are, and for other purposes as early back as like the 1950s. And today, some of these compounds used to treat mattresses have actually been banned, all right? They've been banned. For example, uh, PBDEs. And PBDEs were used as a flame retardant, but a 2003 study published in the Environmental Health Perspective found that PBDEs were being found in alarming levels in mother's breast milk, in U.S. mother's breast milk. In 2001, study found that PBDEs were linked with behavior abnormalities. And this was uh, around 2004 where legislation uh, outlawed them and they've been phased out. But since then, it was determined that chemicals... Uh, these PBDEs were toxic to your liver, thyroid, nervous system. And again, they've been phased out because of that. But just what? These are things that we've been doing and not really asking these questions. And so this is what I, I wrote about here in Sleep Smarter about his discovery because there was a really important nationwide program that took place in New Zealand to protect kids and prevent SIDS, right? Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. And this was back in 1994. In understanding the startling data regarding the hazards of off-gassing mattresses, healthcare professionals throughout New Zealand actively advise parents to wrap their new baby's mattresses in an inexpensive, non-toxic, protective covering. And over the following 20-year span, there was not one single SIDS death reported among the more than 200,000 New Zealand babies who were sleeping on mattresses wrapped with a protective cover. While there was also 1,020 crib deaths reported since the mattress wrapping campaign began, none of those children were sleeping on the beds that were properly wrapped. And this is a tough conversation because we're talking about our babies, we're talking about our kids, and it's just a sensitive subject. But I think that we shouldn't turn a blind eye to something like this and, you know, just a massive uh, application done and looking at how can we better protect our, our kids. Because it's not just the fact that they have these chemicals and it's off-gassing and this kind of thing, but also some of the things that can be causing these reactions are how uh, bacteria and funguses as mattresses are used over and over and over again. You know, it's passing it down kind of thing. Like I slept on a mattress when I was a kid, probably, you know, two people before me slept on, you know, but um, uh, bacteria and funguses interact with those chemicals and they can cause even more strange off-gassing. And so for me, I really took a chance. You know, I knew this research and I knew that though it's controversial, I wanted to share it just to err on the side of caution, you know, when it comes to our kids. And I'm looking at it right now and the note from my publisher and just saying, you know, are you sure you want to put this in here? We know that the data is pretty solid, but it's controversial and this could impact uh, some sales, and I definitely wanted to put it in there. So let's move on to number four. The official number four is really number five here on the list of these four hidden things that could be destroying your sleep quality. And number four, ooh, this is a tricky one. This is a trickster. Did you know that in DC Comics, there's not just the Joker, but they also have the trickster, all right? He's very, you know, he doesn't get the accolades. He doesn't get the, I think the trickster was like, legit just like a jerk you know the joker kind of has some swag but the trickster would like legit give you like a present with like some some dog poop in it or something i don't know but he's not a popular character just neither is this one well actually this one is super popular but not for good reason all right the reason to be uh popular for something positive not this one all right and number five here on our list is sugar sugar now we all know about sugar for issues related to diabetes and obesity and even cancer. But there's a study conducted by researchers at Columbia University that revealed that people who ate the most sugar in their diet throughout the day experienced more intrusions in their deep sleep cycles. Basically, they were being pulled out of deep sleep more frequently without actually 
waking up than those who ate less of the sweet stuff. Really, really fascinating. The lead author of the study also said that too much sugar can delay your body's release of melatonin. Now, we know melatonin to be this uh, glorified sleep hormone, but it really helps to regulate your overall circadian rhythm. It's a powerful anti-cancer hormone, um, anti-obesity uh, hormone, because melatonin actually increases your body's production and mobilization of something called brown adipose tissue. That is a type of fat that burns fat, and the list goes on and on. Now, in relationship to this, we know about the sugar crash. So we just heard that even having sugar early in the day, like a high amount of sugar, can end up causing you to have suppressed dysregulation with your deep sleep. But let's talk about it in the context of like, what if we have sugar close to bedtime? We all know we, about that. Let's, we've we've had this happen before. You know, we get that good sugar crash, right? You may you know maybe you go to IHOP, all right. First of all, what happened to International House of Pancakes? They'll just like forget it. Like it's just too much to say. I don't appreciate that. I liked saying it. Okay, it's like international. I never been international, right? I barely left my city at that point. Now it's just I hop, I hop. As I digress, so maybe we have some. You know, we get the we get the itis, right? We have that sugar crash. It's a good sugar crash, right? You have the you know the pancakes, or you know um, whatever candy and some cookies, whatever. Then you have the, the subsequent crash that takes place. You go into the itis, a little food coma takes place. You've all done it. Sometimes it can feel kind of good. You know, you get pancake drunk. But here's the problem. Research indicates that, you know, we have that sugar spike, which can be kind of a stimulation. And then we have that crash take place. Now, if depending on the timing of things, because I literally, for a time in my life, I would eat two bowls of cereal and a banana before bed. I'm talking like 30 minutes before bed. It was my evening routine, all right? And I was all about that, that honeybee, okay? You know who I'm talking about. And I was all about that guy and, and the banana. And I, just, you know, I just thought, you know, it's whole grain, right? It said it on the box, it's heart healthy. And so uh, what, what could take place is you might go to sleep, but then you have this uh, you can go hypoglycemic when you go to sleep. So your blood sugar gets spiked and then it, then it just crashes. It goes down during sleep and it won't necessarily be enough to wake you up, but there's going to be a stress response. What happens when we go hypoglycemic? We, it's a stress response by your body because your blood sugar needs to be stable for survival. So it's going to be a release of stress hormones like cortisol. And cortisol, guess what it does? It has this inverse relationship with melatonin. So cortisol can literally suppress melatonin. So you might be thinking I'm going to sleep and I'm going to get a great night of sleep and you know I'm going to get my 8 hours, but you're not producing adequate melatonin or you're producing abnormal stress hormones and it's interrupting your actual sleep quality in, in the stages of sleep, right? Which again, it's between 75 to 120 minutes, we'll just say 90 minutes on average for each of the uh, sleep cycles where we go through all four cycles in those 90 minute increments. And this can cause issues with going through those cycles normally. All right, so I hope that makes sense. And so we wanna be really mindful of not having too much carbohydrate before we go to bed. But here's also what the study found was that eating more fiber was linked to spending more time in deep, slow wave sleep. Wow, I didn't know fiber could do that. I knew it was like, you know, we think about in terms of, of, of the poop. And right now I'm thinking about um, the Guardians of the Galaxy 2, Drax. You know, um, I don't know why I'm thinking about this, but uh, Rocket the raccoon, well, he's not really a raccoon, don't, don't tell him that. But he got into an argument with the main character, Star-Lord, played by Chris Pratt. And he was like, when you go to sleep, I'm going to put a turd in your pillowcase. And he's obviously like, don't do that. That's, that's terrible. That's disturbing. And he's like, I'm not going to put my turd because he's a little guy he's like i'm gonna put one of drax turds in your pillowcase and drax is like ha, ha 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 i have famously enormous turds now listen to this because when we think about fiber we tend to think about it in terms of digestive well-being and being quote regular but according to this research eating more fiber is linked to spending more time in deep anabolic sleep 
incredible. The research suggested that it's possibly because fiber slows down digestion and doesn't cause a spike in blood sugar levels like many empty carbohydrates do. So this goes back to what I was saying about the timing of when you're consuming the carbohydrates. Also, the type of carbohydrates you're consuming could also be a big player in whether or not you're getting great high quality sleep. And so understanding how sugar is on this list and one of these things that could be behind the scenes causing issues with your sleep quality. Now, this is something for us. It just adds another layer of understanding when we're really working to transform our lives, transform our bodies. It's not just to avoid sugar because we're trying to get you know six pack abs. It's more so understanding the things behind the scenes that really control your body composition, like your sleep quality. And understanding that when you're sleep deprived, guess what happens with your hunger for sugar? It goes up, right? Ghrelin is increased, leptin is reduced, and you are just generally going to be wanting more sugar. And it creates a vicious circle because the sugar consumption is going to cause issues with our sleep. So we need to break the pattern ultimately and really focus on our lifestyle factors to improve our sleep quality by avoiding some of these crazy kind of hidden things and also incorporating positive things that we know is going to help us to improve our sleep. And so simple here for this particular one with sugar, finish, if you're having some, you know, dessert or, you know, something sweet, have that in a little bit earlier part of, of your day if possible. Give your body, again, a couple of hours to just process and get normalized with your blood sugar and your, you know, your pancreas and glucagon, all this stuff to get normalized. And also let's choose higher quality carbohydrates especially in the later part of the day. So instead of going for the you know, white rice, maybe we're doing some sweet potato. Not to say that you can't have the white rice. you know. So maybe you do some sprouted brown rice and just making sure that we get in a nice amount of fiber because now we understand how important fiber is for our sleep cycles. All right, so I hope that that makes sense and just finding ways to be more creative and going a little bit easier on the sugar period. We know that sugar is highly addictive and it has so many detrimental impacts on our health. But for some of us, we think of terms of like sugar is just this, it's the, that bag of white stuff, but there's sugar in so many different food products in different forms, right? Fruit is sugar dominant food, but it's going to have a different impact depending on the type of fruit and how much you eat because of the fiber and the micronutrients. But for some of us, it can tip us in the wrong direction, even fruit, which is considered to be generally healthy. So just keeping that all in mind and, and understanding the role that this stuff plays. Hey, if you like this video, make sure to check out this video right here to up-level your health today. Not allowing the right things in when the blood-brain barrier is damaged or keeping the wrong things out. A damaged blood-brain barrier can further exacerbate inflammation, poor brain health, and cognitive decline. So what is this blood-brain barrier and how does it 